I haven't talked about this at all, but the, I'm involved in a death penalty <gasps> case. I can't hear what you're saying because they're playing my theme song, but go ahead. Jeff Ross is here. This is Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. This is my lovely co-host. Jacqueline Schultz. My daughter. Hi, you guys. I was saying the last Hi. time I was here, it was like you were in separate studios. There were more COVID issues. This is like very Hamisha. I like that we're all in the same room. It's family. It is. We are family. Yes. I feel like- You're I, like my brother. I'll take it. Okay. Wow, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> that is nice. She doesn't uh, adopt that easily. <laughs> Since we've talked, you, uh, everybody knows you as the roast master. Everybody loves your comedy. That's a that's actually a proto. So if you couldn't be here, yeah. If you couldn't be here, right. You could actually beam in. You didn't have to come here. You could beam in from your house, and I could look at you and talk to you, and you could look at me. Like like FaceTime. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you roasting my technology. By the way, no. I look at you every time I look in the mirror. I see some better looking version of me. So it's really well. Thank you. I mean, thank you. you. Know. Thank you. That's so nice. We we were always looked alike, he's even lying. when we both. No, when we both had. He's lying about what? You're not a better looking version. Oh, oh. Jackie. Sorry, <laughs> supermodel Jackie Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you poking the bear? If you roast my buddy, I don't care if he's your father. You know I'm going to roast you back. Okay, I'll take it. You're dressed for outpatient surgery. What uh, do you even... Yeah. You got a big star in the studio, and you're dressed like you're driving the kids to school. This is our merch. We're oh, selling okay. merch. All right, We're just truly really trying to sell merch. I take it back. HowieMandel.com. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you for bringing it up. If you want to look like a nurse, then you can go to our store and purchase this too. Does that look like a nurse? No, I think it's just the color. Right? The color the is color. like a baby nurse. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what were you? How saying? would you know what a baby nurse looks like? You don't have. <laughs> I children. have a lot of friends with babies. Are you ever gonna? Do you ever want a kid? I hope so. I really do. I know you have a girlfriend. Yeah. And she's of childbearing years. I'm gonna have to talk her into it. She's not there yet. Okay. Yeah. Th there's Thanks, a coffee. Richard. There you go. Wait, she doesn't want one, and you do? Yeah. Really? She's going to kill me over this. Why? Because <laughs> she's not ready for this conversation. Do you want me to phone her? On the internet. <laughs> on the internet. This is on YouTube. Okay. And in the internet. And and everywhere. Do you want me to call her? Are, are you coming close to, uh, to, like, that's a big commitment. I would do it. No, I know you would do it, but are you coming close to convincing to her? Coming inside her? <laughs> <laughs> you're just, you're this far from that. Yeah. You're this far from that. <laughs> No, but I mean, to convincing her because you've been going out with her for how long you've been, been make, going? I've been making, I've been making her, um, go see friends, babies to like, like break her down. That, well, that, that doesn't does. introduce her to Nick Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> but Cannon wound up being the right name for that guy. <laughs> he's, he's not firing blanks. <laughs> oh my God. It's Bazooka man. must be more like Bazooka it, Joe. Yes, he is. Uh, but so are you close to, if she said, maybe give me a minute, give yeah, me, yeah. yeah wow. Yeah. How old is she? Come on. I'm not doing this. Okay. I, I can't do it. She's very private. Okay. She's right. very private. Okay. I won't ask her name. Here's what I want to <laughs> talk to you about. You, I love you. Thank and you. I think you're hilariously funny and I think you've created a lane for yourself, but you're also at the epicenter of everything <laughs> comedy. You really are. You know? I like being where the action is. Howie. You really are. I'll call him just to say hi. And uh, he can't talk now because he's in London playing the O2 with Chappelle, <laughs> you know? And that's, I'll call you back next week. And then I, I'll go, I, I said, well, he can't talk now. He's with uh, Chris Rock and Chappelle <laughs> touring Australia in arenas. Mm -hmm. and, and the audience loves you. And in fact, you were in an arena in Australia. Yeah. And that little kid, JJ, who is yeah. the roaster. Yeah. I just saw him. We should put up this clip, Jer uh, Jeremy, not now. You were in 40 movies in your whole career. 40 movies! Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah, me neither. I haven't heard of any of them. But you know that guy, the, you brought him up on stage. He I was brought a him on stage in um, 
Sydney, I think we were, or Melbourne. Look, that's when you know. That's when you know you're at the epicenter of comedy. I don't remember if I was playing Sydney or Melbourne. 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 I know I drove through Tarzana today. You don't remember <laughs> playing f- with that crowd of fifteen thousand? Already this year, I've been in Hawaii, Melbourne, Sydney, New Zealand, and uh, Paris. Plus, like the regular ass like gigs that I do around. I'm in Vegas this weekend, and then I'm. There it is. San Francisco, Honolulu, Cleveland, Detroit, West Palm Beach, Irvi- Irvine. Ooh. You're not? No, I am. <laughs> D.C. and West. I, I love being on stage. I, like, I always I always took comedy for granted. Like, it was like you know, uh, a path to something else. And now, uh, 30 years in, I'm like, no, no. I'd rather be a comedian than anything else. I like it. And you and I talked about this the other day, like comedy versus acting. And we make this choice that there's no more fun and better mission in life than just making people laugh. But while you were in uh, Australia, you didn't just spend time on stage. You were on a movie set. I did a movie too. With a Farley? Farley? Pete Farley. Pete Farley. uh, John Cena. Yep. Zac Efron, who is fucking gorgeous. Oh my God. Well, if your girlfriend doesn't want to become pregnant. Can we get him onto, into the uh, proto? If you phone him and you have his number, I can get him on right now. <laughs> but I, I was saying that you're at the epicenter because you were also, and I don't know that people know that, you're good friends with uh, Chris and you opened mm-hmm. in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. You were there that night. I was there during his live show on uh, Saturday night. Yeah. And I'm proud of you, buddy. I saw you on TMZ. Uh-huh. I agreed with everything you said. And I was all, and I'm angry and concerned about comedy today because of, listen, he was brilliant. I think he did, I agree with you, everything that he needed to do. But yeah. are you surprised by a, even a little bit of blowback he's getting? No, because I've been around long enough and seen comics rise in their profile where they go beyond the comedy conversation into the cultural conversation. And Anybody who's doing really well, people will latch their cause onto it. But don't you think that happens more now than it ever did? In it our seems th- like it. I mean, maybe I just didn't know big comics 30 years ago, but now I'm like, oh, okay. If you're getting killed on social media, or it's probably because you're killing it. You're crushing it. It's like it's but like, Chris was like at the epicenter that I believe that what happened to Chris with Will is the reason that that guy... Uh, f- m- made it okay for himself to jump on stage to Chappelle at, at the Hollywood Bowl. I agree. Without that, without what he had seen at the uh, at the Academy Awards, he probably would have stayed in his fucking seat. It became in vogue to smack a comedian over a joke you don't like, which to me spoke speaks to me like as that's an emergency. That's you know, what I'm, I was. Uh, I was in bed in in Atlanta watching the Oscars a year ago. Um, we're taping this Oscars week here in Hollywood. So it's exactly a year ago. And when he did that, um, I said to my girlfriend, I said, if Will Smith gets away with this, I'm done. There's no, no place I can work that'll feel safe. If Will Smith gets away with hitting Chris Rock, the biggest, the best, his, his Hollywood colleague over a roast joke, what help is there for any insult comic especially in this world uh, it's just over and luckily there was a media blowback and and then beyond that um the alopecia side of it was so you know i'd always covered it up lied about it you know i have alopecia i always ducked that conversation i didn't want to be you know i didn't want people to like think i was weird or, or or sick i'm not i'm healthy but alopecia is one of those things that um, I just went bald in a month. So then my eyebrows fell out. Then, you know, it's, it's like your eyelashes fall out and you think you're dying. You find out I'm not dying. It's an autoimmune disease. And I look at Jada Pinkett, who's absolutely beautiful. He makes a benign joke about G.I. Jane 2, which, by the way, I'm going to be starring in. I don't know if I should be mentioning that yet. It hasn't been announced, but I'm going to do it. Wow. Um, a mic podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a and, viral moment. And if she had laughed at that joke, she would have normalized this condition for hundreds of thousands of people, a lot of children. And my doctor, who's a research doctor at Yale, um, Dr. Brett King, he had told me... Uh, uh, only weeks before that about a 
a kid, a 10 or 11 year old kid who was wearing a wig at school has alopecia and they pulled it off and bullied her and, you know, she killed herself somehow. And I thought, you know, wow, if, if Jada was able to laugh, even fake laugh, that would have helped so many people destigmatize. Is that the word? Yep. The condition. And so I was personally hurt by it. And whereas, forget that Chris is my friend for a second, forget that I'm a comedian for a second, like the alopecia angle on it kind of jolted me out of bed and made me want to defend him and talk about that angle on it. Yeah, especially because she used it, she kind of weaponized alopecia like you shouldn't mention it you shouldn't make fun of right the fact and it's not even making fun listen comedy is not making fun it's making you laugh or smile at something that is not that's why they call it a sense of humor because you have to sense the humor where it's not so here is a, a young lady suffering from an issue but so much so that she looks beautiful enough to star in a movie that kind of is depicted by a bald woman you know she's in the front row of the oscars yeah but demi a thousand dollar gown she looks phenomenal and her her hair looks phenomenal too or her non-hair looks Whatever. phenomenal her, she has a perfectly shaped head where i look like you know howie mandel if he drowned <laughs> <laughs> but demi moore was be that comparison demi moore was gorgeous yes she shaved her head for that movie. So and I get that there's other arguments that go the other way. Don't tell women how to feel about their hair. Don't tell a black woman how to feel about their hair. Chris Rock should know better. He made a documentary about black women's hair. And I go, all of that is valid. I get all that. But men also, and children also, it's just not happening to adult women. It happens to kids and it happens to men. And as if men don't care about their hair, it's a zillion dollar industry trying to save men's hair. It's like obviously a sensitive thing. So, you know, I don't think any one person gets to own that conversation. But Chris Rock weighed in on it. He didn't even know she had alopecia. Right. No, he said that. And, and either did the world. So the people that were like on will side even before that i think a lot of people that were on will side didn't know she had alopecia they just thought that no they knew because she did a whole she did a whole segment about it on her, her later, her later. Fans. No, 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 no she no. did a red a red table right that's what's called yeah the red re table talk she did a red table talk before that about her alopecia so she's been open about it and talked about it and, but so. but the bigger point is like Nobody cared. It wasn't yeah. a big deal. It's not a health issue. It's just a cosmetic issue. But she didn't issue. seem to care either. She came out to destigmatize it. Can I just stop for one second? I just want to shout out to uh, Kenny, our new uh, producer who does the commercials, and I just put him in charge of the uh, <laughs> the board behind us. What is going Kenny, on? Kenny. You didn't meet Kenny, but he's new with us. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so, I don't know. My point is comedy is king, and we all need to loosen up and laugh a little bit more. But I, I was I was b surprised, blown away. I thought he handled it great. I thought it was really funny. I thought, uh, and I, I just can't believe what's happening in comedy today. And it's bothering me as much as you say you were bothered by that morning after the, are you working on the uh, Oscars this year? Are you writing? No. No. No, but Jimmy's a good friend of mine. So, you know, I'm always there. I'm on his team. Let's just put it that way. I love him and support him. I love him too. He's and a good I guy. know he's going to kill. Right. Um, and uh, you, you, Were that, you there with Chappelle when he brought Elon Musk up? Um, no, but uh, I had a lot of friends who were there, and uh, I knew he was going to come up that night. You did? Yeah. Was it, were they, do you know if they were talking about whether or not it was going to be a good idea and he was going to be received well? Uh, they, there was definitely some trepidation about that, but Elon was gung ho. Yeah? So yeah. it was his decision to do it, even knowing that he might get some backlash. Ultimately, they, they did talk about that it could go different ways, but in the end, you know, everybody wants to be on a freaking stage with Dave Chappelle, <laughs> so why not? Especially in Silicon Valley, they were up in San Fran, so. Did you hear how he felt even afterwards? Uh, after no, he shook it off and was fine. Okay. You can't really throw these guys. When you go on ahead of Chappelle or Chris Rock, what is that like? Is that, you know, 
I was the opening act years and years ago for like Diana Ross right. and, and other people, not comedians. I never opened for another comedian. Is that, they weren't there to see me and I could really feel it. I feel like these audiences embrace you and love you and are there. Yeah, you know, I will say, unlike an opening act, they both, the shows are sold out before I'm even, so it's not like they're, I'm not advertised. Right. Especially with Which Dave. makes it harder, no? No, because then, you know, the DJ, DJ Trauma, Dave's DJ, for instance, will say, you know, when Dave comes to town, he likes to bring some of the heat, he likes to bring special guests, and, you know, and I'll come out as a special guest. And then you get a little pop. You know, if half the crowd knows who I am or whatever it is, they're like, oh, this is different. We weren't planning this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like electric. And that to me is super fun when you get that it's extra Kenny's pop. dog. Kenny's dog just <laughs> what came is in. Kenny, I wonder the boy Kenny I told talking. you not to bring the dog. <laughs> Come here, doggy. That's, That's Kenny's dog. Kenny's dog. Ken He's anyway. a cute dog. Anyway. Kenny. I love dogs. Yeah. He probably smells my dog. I just took her on a long walk. Nah, I think he just doesn't like the smell of Kenny. <laughs> Always keeps walking away from Kenny. Kenny can't hold on to the dog. When <laughs> Kenny's been working on the board, yeah. not paying Fucking, attention to the dog. Get Howie, ready for a commercial cut. You come to Howie's place. He's got like his daughter. You got dogs. You got babies. You got robots. I don't know what the fuck's <laughs> going. Bob's big boy. I don't know what this. Oh, Howie. It's Bobby. That's how, it's that's Bobby. Bobby. I was kidding. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. Bobby's world. What do you think? I was born in oh, fucking. Uh, you saw that. That's like a mix between Bobby yeah, and Bob's. Yeah, that's big what boy. I was saying. When you go on. <laughs> When you go on in Paris, yes, what is that like? You're playing. The, uh, all, I guess they all understand English. They're there to see Dave, or they're there, right? You know, I guess it's the Netflixing and the YouTubing of the world, where I can go on stage in Paris and they understand every word I say. I bring people on stage to get roasted and ask them questions, and I can't ha understand half of what they're saying. So they understand our dialect, but we don't necessarily understand theirs. So you will Comedy is this great American export, the way, I guess, jazz was at one point, and the movies are. Really? So, And, and how big were the crowds in Paris? <sighs> um, not arena size, a couple thousand, a few thousand a night. That's fantastic. The best. It's so, you so can, cool. There's no place in the world that you can't play. I guess so. That's pretty amazing. I did shows in Africa, uh, not with Dave, but on my own uh, a few years back, and I couldn't believe. Plus, like, stand up so new, and the way, you know, my thing of, like, making fun of Nelson Mandela and making fun of the people on stage, and, like, it rewired people's brains. They were losing Wait, it. wait, wait, wait. Let's go back. How, why, who, where, who booked you in Africa? Trevor Noah told me that I need to do a show in Johannesburg. He told me... That's his hometown. He told me that it'll blow my mind. And more importantly, it'll blow theirs. Stand-up's only like 10 or 15 years old there. Before that, it was like, you know, it was like practically minstrel, sh like and, and like white guys acting black and black. Like it was so antiquated. So now modern stand-up comedy is so fresh there that they had a, some kind of comedy festival. And uh, I, I produced and judged a roast battle with the biggest comics in uh, Africa. And then I did a stand-up show, uh, you know, for thousands of people. And they wouldn't just laugh. They would stand up, run around in a circle and sit back down. They just couldn't believe. I was like, hey, I went, took a tour on Soweto yesterday of Nelson Mandela's, uh, you know, home where he, where he lived for 20 years. And people always say such admirable nice things about nelson mandela nobody ever talks about what a shitty interior decorator he was <laughs> and they'd all been to this you know museum so they're all laughing because they know he's got like a leopard skin couch and a, <laughs> a shitty <laughs> ugly chairs and, and they, like, they 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 could have taken they could have been very nationalistic about it and, and owned it but they had a good sense of humor and that's what draws me back to these exotic you know, locations, or at least as far as stand-up goes, exotic locations. Because they haven't caught that kind of PC bug yet. Because I don't know that you could do those kind of jo jokes here, even in America. You can, yeah. as the roast, like people know what's preceding you. Right. But I think there'd be a lot of people that go, you can't, you can't talk about that. Right. You can't 
talk about that. Were you surprised also that- Or you shouldn't. You know, it's like taboo or it won't work. You can, you're allowed, but there's no way you're going to get laughs. So like the idea of like this this release, you know, it's all a little bit, it's kind of connected to, you know, we were talking about normalizing alopecia before. Like more and more I get when I, you know, when I do my shows, I say, who wants to come on stage? You probably see me do this. The lights come on, people volunteer and they come on stage and I'm, they have to volunteer. If someone's pointing at their husband or the wife, I go, that's bullying. That doesn't work for me. You got to stand up and want to come up more and more. I get disabled people, people with some sort of disability or, and because they know that I will help the audience laugh with them and not at them. And that's kind of new for a lot of people with a disability or a limp or a lisp or a stutter or a deformity. Like all that's off the table. I'll be just as mean to the beautiful woman as I am to the guy with a with one leg. I had a guy not too long ago, I was on the road and the guy had like, you know, one leg and he hop, he just, I thought he was drunk. I see this guy wobbling on stage and he gets up there and I see his, he wants it. He, he's not, he, he doesn't want to be treated, you know, like there's something wrong with him. This guy, you know, and I said, like, are you faking? Is that the mic stand? Where's the mic stand? <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. And he goes, oh, I go, what happened? He goes, oh, I was in a motorcycle accident. I go, wow. And, and, and he, like, he goes, he's still riding. <laughs> he go, and everyone claps that he's brave enough to still be riding. <laughs> and I'm like, so you're trying to lose your second fucking leg? What are you doing? And uh, finally he's like, He's like, this is my buddy over here, and there's this big fat guy. And I go, so you're hanging out with the only guy here who's slower than you? And, uh, <laughs> and then finally, uh, I go, man, you really took the jokes tonight. Uh, you really have thick skin. Unfortunately, you left some of it on the 405. <laughs> 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 so this guy, and then, you know, I'll see him afterwards, and, you know, taking pictures. And you know, you not just made his day, you changed his life. He's got a story to tell. He's not sympathy. People aren't like, oh. Oh, oh, what happened? You know, it's like they're not, they're not, they're not uh, treating him with kid gloves. They're treating him like, like a person. Like there's no such thing as a normal person anymore. To me, everybody's normal. We've that. That's a great thing about uh, whatever you want. To, the upside of the evolution. You want to call it wokeness. You want to call it uh, inclusive, being more inclusive. That that to me is the best part of it. Is that you know everybody's everybody yeah and no two people are alike exactly no, so there isn't a norm there isn't what is but w what's interesting is what we believe other people will accept and i think when you do those jokes not only do you make him feel more comfortable i think you make the crowd and the other people that are there more comfortable it's like removing the stigma which you even had to telling people you had alopecia like when you're telling me the story, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm being totally honest with you. I don't know why I wouldn't say I had alopecia. You know, I don't know what your thought process was, but 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 obviously, I was to, lying about it. Why I was wearing makeup? Well, you I didn't tell people sunglasses. that you had OCD for a long time. Yeah, that seems like because I thought that mental health, which I'm I'm open to now, I thought that mental health was something. Even the word mental from my generation has a negative. Sure. I want to m remove that stigma and I want to remove the stigma. Look what you're doing. You know, they always say laughter is the best medicine, but I think you are injecting it because you're injecting it right into the looks, the soul, the human being that is standing there in front of you. You know what I mean? It's not like they don't have to get the joke. You see the joke, whatever that is blaring in front of the audience is what you're making fun of in the moment and if the audience can and first and foremost the person that you're roasting can get on board that's a signal for the audience yeah we can get on board you know i think what you're doing is really 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 important thank you when people um, you said, I won't do it unless somebody volunteers to come on stage. Have you ever had somebody come on stage, they volunteered, and then it went bad? <laughs> Only, sometimes they'll be drunk, and they think it's their chance to grab the mic and 
shout out their cousin in the audience or make roast me back. I'll let them get one line off and usually, but for the most part, I'm pretty careful about vetting um, people that are good sports. Um, and they got to want it, you know, they, but I remember your special from the prison. Yeah. Then nobody got mad at you in the prison. Oh, that was different. That was a little <laughs> different. That was a little different. There might have been one or two, but I think in the end, there was but it doesn't one. matter. They're locked up. They can't. No, get you. they're all. That's the other thing about it. I shot that eight years ago. Right? So they're out. <laughs> they start coming out. Yeah. Not everybody's they, a murderer. Some people are just in there for a little while. So there was a guy, and God, I might regret telling the story one day when he shows up, but. <laughs> There was a guy, if you recall, early in the show, he had swastika tattoos, and I made some joke about We're probably like, cutting in a clip of that right now if you're watching it on, on YouTube. Then you know you've got a good crowd. We have a clip here. Let's take a look. That's where the white dudes hang out? Does anybody ever get offended by your tattoo? Anyway, good luck with the rest of your stay in jail. How many years? 99. Dude, you should get... Six million years for every Jew that died in the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> this, man. That's what he gives you. And the, I, I said something to the effect of the war, the, the war is over, but that tattoo is permanent. And, and you know, everyone laughed at him. It was a, he was a little, he was embarrassed. And I did a couple other lines about him and I moved on. And it became a sort of a, you know, a, a viral moment and people mentioned it to me in the press and I think Conan showed a clip. And so uh, last year I did get a DM from the guy because I recognized his face going, I'm out, motherfucker, LOL. Oh my God. <laughs> Explain to me where the LOL comes in. <laughs> I guess it's his way of not He's going laughing. back to jail. <laughs> if he didn't put the LOL, I could have reported him, but he probably would have broken his 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 parole but uh and then th there's another thing did you on. did you answer him no no i was oh. scared okay i was scared this is the answer right now telling this story Somehow his name is the kenny answer. his name is kenny and now he does our commercials yeah. and he has a dog <laughs> kenny the odd, the odd of this <laughs> texas nazi listening to H howie and jackie's podcast is probably <laughs> probably slim but there is another thing going on with that show and i haven't talked about this at all but it came up right before New Year's where uh, the, I'm involved in a death penalty <gasps> case. What? Why? It stems from that show. Tell me. Um, I went a week early. This is Texas where they take their law enforcement very seriously. Seriously as I take my comedy. <laughs> and... You know, I had written a thousand jails and finally got one to let me come in. This is a special on Comedy Central called Jeff Ross Roast Criminals. And I'm there a week, so I get to know everybody because I wanted a method roast, like know everybody before the show. So I come in on Monday, I'm eating breakfast, I'm playing basketball, I'm eating lunch, I'm interviewing people. With the convicts? With, with the, in, the people that are in, in, incarcerated. And I learned that too you know, over the course of it. I don't call them prisoners. I don't call them convicts. They're people that are in jail. I wanted to humanize them. I wanted to sort of understand them. I didn't want to prejudge. And most importantly, I didn't want to know what their crime was. If they wanted to tell me, they could tell me. So I don't know a murderer from a guy who didn't pay his, his parking tickets. And I walk into this one room, you know, it's full of, full of dudes probably 50 dudes in there. I don't know what their crimes are, but there's this table off to off in the back with two or three really scary, gigantic white supremacists. And sitting between them, almost like holding court, is a 19-year-old Asian kid. So the whole prison is white supremacists and like Mexican gangbangers with teardrop tattoos. And then this little scrawny kid and it wasn't my best moment, Howie, you know, comic to comic. I, I, I was like, what are you in for? Hacking a computer? And, you know, the guys <laughs> laugh. And the, this kid goes, oh, I hacked some. Ha hacking's the operative word. And I was like, huh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to him a couple more minutes. I, it, it didn't really go anywhere. And uh, the next day, 
you know, or shortly after that footage all gets subpoenaed into this kid's, I don't know why or what's going on. Turns out he hacked up a college professor um, in Texas at Texas A&M. Um, killed him. Killed him. He wanted to see him die. He admitted it. And he badly wounded the guy's wife who was in a wheelchair. He was ruthless. And the when he was sentenced, they used the footage of him making that joke with me to show that he was unremorseful and gave him the death penalty. So his lawyers are, um, what's that word? Subpoenaing? Uh, no, uh, uh, appealing his death penalty convention to, to conviction to the Supreme Court. So now I'm waiting to find out if the Supreme Court's going to help this guy. Do you have an opinion on the death penalty? I do. So are you upset that you're depending? What's your opinion? Do you want to say it's it? It's a mixed message because this guy is what the death penalty is designed. You know what? I'm going to hold. I'm going to hold off because I don't want to further influence what happens. I'm, gonna, I'm not pro death penalty. I'm going to bite my tongue on this one, but I will say it's very unlikely the Supreme Court will. The good. The bad news is the Supreme Court probably won't help this guy. The good news is I'm performing at their Christmas party this December. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's my way out of it. <laughs> it's such a touchy subject, and this guy's life is sort of hanging in the balance. It's amazing how many comics have been involved in these high-profile cases. Remember Larry David, that guy that was at yeah. the baseball game? What happened? That's, oh, a, docu that's a documentary. You have to I watch it. I think it's on Netflix. It. There's a documentary about some guy that was charged with murder, and he was uh, at least given a life sentence or maybe the death penalty. And no, he was just in court, and his lawyer they, they, they was were gonna, to, They were going to go for that, yeah. and he was trying to appeal, and what the guy remembered is he remembered he was at a Dodger game, and they were shooting an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Mm. So they went and found the tape of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and sure enough, he was in that tape, in, in, the, that background. Ca in the background of, you know, there's 20,000 people there, whatever there is. They found him in the background. Therefore, he could not have been, because they had a timeline of when the guy got murdered. So because, <laughs> so Larry David <laughs> saved this guy from a life in prison or a death sentence. And Larry David's in the documentary too, talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, again, <laughs> following suit, yeah. may be able to save somebody from a, Death penalty. Uh, or maybe guy, you got them the death penalty. I don't know. Uh, it's all that's all kind of, we'll see. You know, comics <laughs> always use the expression, I killed. And you <laughs> literally <laughs> may have. It's not funny. What? It's not funny. But it's, it's the truth is what it's, I'm going. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Does that scare you? Uh, it scares me, but I, 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 there's a part of me that likes the adventure of never knowing where your next gig is really going. You know, like I used to think you go to the place, you do the gig, you get your check and you move on. But I've been around long enough to know that sometimes these gigs, these gigs stay with you. They follow you. Like they're, they're these little microcosms that can become bigger and bigger and bigger. And, 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 you never forget them. And for me, like, I've never been a guy, you know, Howie, I think of you beyond being a star, I think of you as a, you have a business, you have a production company. Like, I, I don't have that discipline. To me, I want to eat in every restaurant. I want to do every gig. I want to talk to every person. I, 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 I don't have the discipline to, 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 to be a, to, 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 to be in the business in a certain way. Yeah, you I, do. I want the adventures. I want the... I, I, I don't understand what you're saying that's different than what I want. You you created Roast Battle. Sure. Which is a TV show, and I know is... Uh, I uh, had to. I didn't want to. What? It was Why? like, I didn't like seek it. It was like, if I don't do this, nobody will. Like, this is, has to be done. But you so realize I that's a business, and we do Roast Battle. JFL produces it in Canada, you know that, and of it's course. probably, is it in a lot of other countries? It's in a dozen countries. And you own a, a piece land. of them all. Yeah. So that's a business. That's a big business. Don't you understand that? Okay. 
<laughs> it was something that happened not not necessarily through ambition or or whatever it was more like passion passion sure everything i do is about passion I and think we talked about that i love that about you yeah you want to do it because you want to do it because you think it's cool sometimes these passionate uh paths don't lead to huge money sometimes they lead to big money they don't always lead to big success sometimes they lead to failure but we're all chasing whatever we're chasing i think you and i are much more alike than you think i think we are and i've known you for a long time and what i love about you and i said to you the last time you were here and i whenever i work with you and i see you that you are genuinely a really good person a really nice person a really good friend a really good, I mean, just wa watching him. And that's how, you, when you know somebody is a good person is you watch how they are when things are shitty. And when things are shitty, he is one of the first people there, you know? And the, the way you dealt with, uh, you know, some of the losses that we've all had in the last couple of years, Bob Saget and uh, Gilbert Godfrey and their families. And Will Smith. Yeah. I'm holding for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I, give a I, I miss Gilbert and Bob with all my heart more than I ever imagined I could. You know, it's like, <sighs> and you know, really I know a, you feel that pain. You were very yeah. close with Gilbert. And, yeah. and, and we talked right up until the end. You and I were in constant contact about all that. And then yeah. with, with his wife, Dara. And, you know, part of the mission, you know, circling back to these tour dates it's like i calling it the life and death tour because between the death penalty thing the uh, and losing all my friends you know not all my friends but these key friends you know you make an investment in a human being for 20 30 years and then you know that that gets pulled all of a sudden suddenly um it it, it it's kind of like I feel a responsibility, whether it's on stage or even on your show, like stuff like this, to keep their name alive, to keep talking about them. Um, but you don't only do that. You talk to their wives. You are still uh, entertaining and going to dinner with their children when, yeah. you, when you come out. Yeah. I mean, it's not just these I aren't love just Max. works. Gilbert's son is totally hilarious. You told me he's hysterical. He's so funny. He wrote me the funniest fucking text. I got to read you this text. <laughs> okay. I love this. <laughs> it's from Gilbert Godfrey's son. Max. You know, I mean, this is How like, old is he? He's 13. So he had COVID, right? Wasn't serious. I knew he was okay, but I texted him because we text and I go, I go, uh, how you feeling, bud? He wrote, not bad, just some dot, 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 and then pasted. <laughs> Must be from Wikipedia. Fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, <laughs> fatigue, muscles or body aches, headache, no loss, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, <laughs> runny nose, nausea, or vomiting, diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Every possible <laughs> symptom of COVID that he looked up. That's hysterical. That I just wrote back, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's a really funny guy. He and, really uh, is. Yeah, and I, I, I just love him to death. And, and I see Gilbert in him and so that helps me too you know that's fantastic um you are a mensch in coming by and just talking to me and just being here for all your friends i mean i've, I've loved watching you on tmz the day after the chris rock you know was it okay i was cleaning up dog poop is that what you were doing yeah <laughs> They never panned down to the dog. So I they don't didn't. I didn't know what you were doing. It was so awkward. I was, I was like with my dog. And they start hitting me with Here, questions. And put you know it up. It, put it up. Uh, Jeff Ross on TMZ. Now that I know what you're doing, it maybe makes sense. But I loved what you said. And I love that you were there. And I love that you took a stance. And I loved what your, I loved your stance on it. But Thank you. No, I'm sure he thanked you. He didn't. He didn't. Yeah, one day I was mad. I was like, oh, I hope he no. doesn't see this. Is this it? Yeah, this well, was one day ago. Ad. No, it's not one day ago. This it is was, when it was posted. No, it's, didn't you, wasn't it the day after? It yeah. wasn't yesterday. They might have posted it yesterday. Oh, there you are. Yes. Yeah. Look at him. You're looking, oh, you're looking at you're shit. You're looking down. To <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why. <laughs> why why are you squatting? I think I had just done it or something. <laughs> Here's a guy that... Stood up for himself using his words. Hang on, stop it right there. Yeah. Stop it right there. Amazing.
I thought, now that I'm watching it, here's a guy that just, okay, TMZ is here. I'm going to get down here and I'm going to show them what's standing up for yourself. <laughs> is like, I'm actually going to demonstrate, because I don't know if TMZ is closed caption, right? So it looks like, here's a guy that stood up for himself and you timed it right to your stand-up. I love what you said. Keep going. Yeah. He's the smartest guy I know. What, was it one of the best roasts of all time? How about roast, but it was a epic roast. performance. Yeah. Chris well, Rock could have been an astronaut. He could have run the world. He chose to be a comedian. Lucky us. What do you think his best joke was? Can I ask you something? Oh, Stop yeah. for just a second. The uh, reporter. Is it a seven-year-old? She it's was. A, she wasn't good. No. She she was recording me. First of all, I'm just walking did, my. Did dog. you like? Did you like what the, he said? She's not <laughs> looking at me. She's, not, she's, she's holding the camera on me, yeah. but reading her questions off her phone. That's what you think. She's looking down at the sidewalk so she doesn't step in the <laughs> shit that you haven't picked up. <laughs> and uh, I watched it back and I go, oh, I guess I made a good point, but Chris doesn't want anybody talking. Like, I, I, will he, I don't, will he ever mad, mention I, it I was again? mad. I was this was so fresh i felt like it's okay to stand up for my buddy but i wish i had just said i was offended by the whole thing i mean why would he wear white after labor day and they just walked away <laughs> <laughs> like that's what i should have done well you just did <laughs> you know but uh yeah and i do like i made a point about he says what should okay, will play it, okay. play it play it the whole thing conceptually was amazing it was yeah. about parenting at the end of the day it was an amazing special about parenting <laughs> Back. Who do you think won the, the battle? Chris Rock? <laughs> oh, I don't know. About or Will that. Smith? I don't think it's a battle. You don't think so? I like the way Chris handled it. Yeah? Yeah. A, a lot <laughs> of it's his mind and not his fist. And to me, that's game over. Yeah? Yeah. Kind of a KO? I'm not, I'm not in the sports betting business, but <laughs> as, a, as a comedian, I thought it was amazing. Yeah? Yeah. It's, it's what do you, to be a tiny part of it. What do you think his I, best joke was? Just His best joke? Yeah. Oh, that one about Jay-Z and Beyonce, that made me laugh a lot. That might be the joke of the year. Can I ask, people are, people are wondering whether Will <laughs> is going to respond. Should that he? I don't know. How that's, should, out of my, that's out of my jurisdiction. How do you think he should respond? With a sense of humor. Yeah? I got to go. Let me ask one, <laughs> one last thing. You do Comedy Central roast battle. Yeah. I mean, should it be I, <laughs> should it be tip for tat, Will Smith, Chris Rock? Come out to Vegas this Cut week, to the I'm next day. The she's still with yeah? you. Yeah? How does Chris, how does Will Smith Stop it. Stop it for a second. We had lunch together. Yeah. And she's right behind you right now. That'd be funny if we see you lying in bed and her head comes up from behind you, spooning you. One more thing. Did you? Are yeah. you going to brush your teeth when you wake up? I'm glad you thought it was okay. Afterwards, I was like, oh, I don't even want to be weighing in on this. Well, you just pointed out something that I didn't notice that I th was thinking for a second, but then it went away because I was listening to what you were answering. But the fact that they never showed that you were with the dog. <laughs> So you just had this weird string in your hand and you kept looking at the ground and bending <laughs> down and looking. It's just, what the fuck is he doing? It was, a weird, one. It was a weird one, you know? Yeah. And you're just, everybody, get, everybody gets dragged into this conversation whether they want to or not. You were there. You were there and yeah. you're his friend and you're the guy to talk to and that's how I opened up this podcast. But the truth of the matter is you've been a good friend, you've been a great supporter. And I think that your take even more than Chris's, your take on when this shit happens, of how people are taking jokes and how it should be um, received and if there how it should be reciprocated if you want, that's, you are the roast master. You know, that's what you do. This is, if you want to ask anybody about what happened that night at the Oscars, how it was handled after, how it is being handled now, I would talk to you before I talk to Chris or Will about that. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think? And I think you get a good, clean, kind of um, a professional narrative that people on the inside can't see. Mm. Don't you think? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I always... Comedy for me, it's a tribe. I think of myself as a comedian before I think of myself as an American or as a Jew or anything else. Like, I'm a comedian. Really? And I think about, like, on a human level. And then from there, it all sorts of... Once I go through that filter, I, I can usually find 
the professional take? Well, if you think of yourself as a comedian before you think of yourself as a Jew, with the way people are canceling people left and right, we are right in the middle of a fucking holocaust right now when it comes to comedy. <laughs> right? I mean, it's killing people, and it's that people are losing their jobs and losing their platform and losing their voices. You are one misspoken phrase away from losing everything. Even someone powerful is... You know, they, what they, it, it, it's really, you know, we go back to the jail thing. I'm a big believer in second chances. And if you don't give people a path back, what are you doing? But, you know, I, when I grew up, a big a little jingle in a song is sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Sure. Names will never hurt me. Sure. But names and words are what is hurting everybody today. Right. You know, we got to watch out. But I, I do I hope- like that he said, I'm not a victim. Chris said in a special, yes. that he wasn't a victim. And I think that's important for people to remember. Like, like life is hard. You know, th- not everything is, yeah, it's okay to, everyone's a little depressed sometimes. Everyone's a little triggered sometimes. That's fucking life. You, you know, you just get up and you keep moving and you keep working and you keep. So I have a thing like, Sometimes if I'm if I'm down in the dumps or or whatever it is, I don't get as low as some people. I'm lucky, but I do find that a fake smile can become a real smile. Like if I can force myself to get off the couch, look at the dog, smile, and go, "What's up, dog? What's up, Nipsey? Let's go out." Like eventually, my fake forced smile. I learned this doing shows for the military. I was uh, um, in the during during the the heyday of the Iraq occupation, the American occupation of Iraq, I, I did a lot of, there was a lot of wounded people coming back. I went to Germany to that hospital in the Landstuhl and I went to Walter Reed and, and the other one in DC. There are now one um, a bunch of times. And it was horrifying at times. And it, it, you know, I'd been, I'd had my own trauma. I lost my parents as a young, as a teenager. So I understood the idea of taking a deep breath and putting your head up and, and moving on. I, I understood that. And, but sometimes you go, you don't always see it like in a microcosm, you know, like how does, how do you really actually do that? What's the recipe? And I learned it. I self-taught myself that they, they, they would come in, they would go, okay, we're in room 703. This guy is uh this guy has a, a severe brain injury, and uh, and uh, he he is uh, open to a visit. Um, he may or may not even know who I am. You know, uh, he might be a fan, might not, might have a. You don't know what you're walking into, and when it's brain injuries, there could be half of their cranium could be missing. You know, they it, it's it, it's horrifying and unpredictable. So what I would do to brace myself and prepare myself was as I opened that door I had put a smile on my face so no matter what I saw I was already smiling sometimes it's just a mother crying in the corner sometimes it's a guy under the sheets and sometimes it's a guy that's happy to see you and he's all patched up and when I put that fake smile on I was able to channel a real smile and I've used that since then I think those are good, great words of wisdom. I think there is some science and chemical or biological um, study that says that there are endorphins released when you smile that would create a, a lighter mood. So that works. Listen, you're, you entertain us, you teach us, you are going to see us. I want to plug one more time. This is the Life or Death Tour. Mm-hmm. And you can see him like uh, this coming weekend in Vegas. And then all the dates, if they want all the dates besides uh, replaying this podcast and looking at the, the sign behind me, they can go to, is it JeffRoss.com? Roastmaster. Roastmastergeneral.com. Roastmastergeneral.com. They're which all we'll up put, there. Which we'll, we'll put there. They're, they're right there. And do not miss him. It is a real joy always to see you. I feel like I'm I'm lucky I get to see you in person as much as I did. Thank you for coming. And uh, that's really the end of this show. It was a (laughs) wonderful conversation and it flew by and uh, shout out to Gilbert and, and, and Bob and, and, and Belzer and, um, and uh, all the comedians. I do really feel like 
we're a tribe and we look out for each other and it's weeks like this i was coming here and i ran into i was walking my dog and i ran into ronnie chang who's a very funny comedian he's staying in my neighborhood and i was like i drop everything when i see another comedian and chris has that too i remember going to a fancy party one time and uh, like all these big you know new york socialites were there and like chris is literally like in the coat room talking to the hat check guy and then i walked in and he's like a comedian i can talk and then we just you know so i love you howie that's i my love point. you too that's buddy and this was great see you next time that was great that's fun that was good one. how do we do do we hold the mic up is mike there